Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our soul self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Good morning. Usually we think of God and we think of God as the judge. Today I propose somebody else as the judge today. Today I propose to you that God does not always function in the same way. God does not always move exactly the same. And today I don't propose to you to think of God as the judge. I propose to you that God is much more than our judge. As much as he would love to be the judge in this situation, he is not. There is a, somebody in here who is the judge today. And it is you. As much as God would love to force enlightenment. Our ability to understand what God has done for us, he doesn't. He leaves it to each and every one of us. He treats it as a child. He gives us everything we need. And in that, he is not the judge. We are the judge. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2 says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. In 3 and 4, he presents this case to you. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Today, we are asking this simple question. What causes revival? What starts revival? The answer is this. When you are so fully persuaded that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you are ready for a conviction, that you are ready to pass a verdict and say, Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has done that one thing that matters more than all the rest in Scripture. He has proven himself to be Lord. He has proven himself to be the risen Lord in which all opportunity is offered to us. This week, the accusation has come to you already. This week, whether you've heard the news, whether you've talked to people, listened to the radio, you have already heard. The resurrection is on trial. You are told that Christianity is a religion. There are many other religions. You are told that the Bible is sacred scripture. There is other sacred scripture. You are told that all these myths and stories all mix together. And whether we're talking about Aesop's fables or the Bible, they're just myths. And the reality is they have presented their case all week. The world has presented their case to you to break down Christianity into something smaller than it is. It is not another religion. We are a religion based on one event in history. And apart from that, nothing matters. There is no revival. There is no forgiveness of sins. There is no hope. There is no meaning. There is nothing in this life. Today we present to you the case for the resurrection. Exhibit A. Verses 5 through 8, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. We rarely think about the biggest traitors in history. Usually we think of... You know, those in the American Revolution who switched sides. Or we think of those who helped 
secretly, these spies. But the worst traitors in history are those 12 men who betrayed Judaism, who took what God had given and said there is another. They said that God is not one, but God is one as in a bunch, as in three. The biggest traitors in history are the apostles. They did not simply come from Judaism and transition and act naturally go, well, we accept Jesus. They fought it. They fought it. They fought it. Till the day he died, they ran away when he was captured. Because they were the biggest traitors in history. This is not a story of Judaism just flowing over to these Christians. It is them completely rejecting everything. And saying, everything that I have learned and been taught and been raised to believe is wrong. The truth is that there is so much more than the law. And we see that this change of these people is not something that would naturally occur. If the resurrection is not true, then why would the apostles give up on everything they believed? Why would Paul make such outrageous statements about there were 500 witnesses? Many of them are alive today. You know how you check that out? Go ask them. He makes outrageous statements and our faith is so outrageous. Why couldn't God make it easy and say something easy like, I love you, love one another, let's keep it simple. But he didn't do that. He said, I'm going to give you a story of a child born of a virgin who is born of the seed of God. He is going to give his life for your sins. And give us a story that is so radical that the apostles had to be stupid to make up something so dumb. And think about our witnesses. If I'm going to pick some good witnesses, I'm going to pick people who are trustworthy. Not people who can't even testify in court. I'm not going to take a bunch of women who aren't allowed to testify in court and say, these are the witnesses of the resurrection. These are the ones who first saw Jesus. The story we present to you of the resurrection is so radical that to believe that it's anything less than truth is to declare everyone in the story crazy. Exhibit B. We're presented with this when Paul converted. He said, for I'm the least of the apostles. And not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Paul. Such a strong, faithful Jew. Such a great example of protecting the divine, that which is holy, that which was given by God on Mount Sinai, that which was the very words of God. He defended with all his heart. He made sure that those who were trying to fight against God, he stopped and crushed. And this very same man radically after serving God faithfully believes that something is greater than what he's serving. And the story of Paul in itself is such a proof for the resurrection. Because how much would you have to be convinced to give up what you believe? To give up everything that you believe and everything you've been taught. He was taught by the best. He can claim his teacher and we can go, I know that name. He can say, I was taught by Gamaliel. The very Gamaliel who wrote half of the book. And he can turn around and say, I've given up all of that. I count that all as lost. Me, who persecuted the whole church is now seeking to lead that same church. How much did this resurrected Lord 
affect Paul to change everything. But he continues. Exhibit C. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Think about this. These men who serve God are either the biggest liars in history. They were nuts. They were just plumb crazy. Or there was something that they witnessed that changed their whole life. And there's not another option. We can't look at this and go, Christianity is kind of like another religion. It's not. Because you have men betraying their faith to serve it. And you have them admitting that they are nothing more than false witnesses if the resurrection is false. And that everything they do is pointless. When we look at church history and we look at how everyone dies, one of those great stories, right? Follow Jesus, you get to die. That was our original slogan. We'd say, come to church, you're going to die. And it was very popular. It picked up and it grew. And wait a minute, that doesn't work. This wasn't a popular fad, a popular religion. It was a religion that said, let me offer you of first things the opportunity to die. To lay down your life. That's the very first thing you get offered from God. You said, all you have to do is give me everything. And this religion had something going on that was so remarkable that people said, yes. The apostles who, if we're false witnesses, died for what was a lie so that they gained nothing. And if there is no resurrection, it was all vain, pointless, and they lost everything. Think about it. These men who gave up on their families, what did Christ say? He said, if you love mother or father more than me, can't be to my disciple. And for many of those early followers, it was true. For many of them, it was true that when they chose to follow God, they needed to give up everything in their life. To lay it all down and to assume for a second that these men were crazy enough to do this without something mighty to persuade them. Today, we look at Islam and how they're serving in such a way that it's very devout. They're willing to die, kill. But when we look back to the beginning, when we go back, we're talking about our apostles, the ones who started this, the very witnesses of it and the death that they experienced. We look back to Islam and we say, what happened to Muhammad? He was wealthy. He was very fruitful. He was given everything he wanted. He became a king on earth. If I offered you two options, you get to die. Very painful, excruciating death. Come on, that's choice one. Number two, you've got a second option. You can become a king and be blessed and be given everything. I'll give you all a second to think. Don't worry. It's a hard question, right? It's a hard question. You know, if you were presented with two different choices and one was everything, the other is losing everything. And we look at the beginning of religions and we realize that those who started these religions were treated with such great respect. And no matter which religion we look at, Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, Their founder is treated as a great hero and was until his death. He was blessed. He gained something in his life. But our apostles gained nothing in their life. They lost everything because they laid it all down. Exhibit D. For if the dead are not raised, 
Not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now think about these same apostles who offered everything. They also were willing to condemn you for an eternity. Because all the apostles believed in the law. And the law said that if you did not keep the law, you would die. There was a mountain of blessing. There was a mountain of curse. And they were sentencing everyone who followed them to that cursed mountain. They were saying, you remember when God said, on this mountain is the curse. If anything touches it, kill it. That same mountain is the same mountain that the apostles would send everyone who followed them to. And that is how we're told the story is that this was made up. This was distorted. And it makes no sense. Because our founders are so different. The basis of everything we believe comes down to one single event that is falsifiable. That is provable. That can be shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that it happened. When we look at history, we don't find this empty chair and go, wait, there was nothing here. We find God giving us proof after proof after proof. The Romans wrote about the crucifixion of Jesus. Pilate recorded it. And God gave us so much evidence that he's not even acting as God. He comes into the courtroom and gives you all the evidence. He comes into life and he says, I will judge you. Let me show you how it works. These are the exact questions I'm going to ask you. Here's the answer you need. When I come to judge you, all you need to be able to say is Jesus is Lord I am his and he is mine. And today, each of you is the judge. Each and every one of you is the judge. And when you are fully convinced that the resurrection is beyond a shadow of a doubt, revival begins. When there is that much faith, then there is nothing that can stop our God. And we ask about revival, and revival starts with how many? How many was Paul? The, the most radical conversion of history is the story of one man. The spreading of Christianity to all the Gentile world, which includes us. One man. And the gospel reenacted shows us that God not only is the judge, but he gives us all the cheat answers. It's as though he gave us a test and said, here's the answer, copy them down. Most of us would assume he's a bad teacher. And the fact is, he is a judge because he is holy and righteous. But he does everything he can so that we answer the right way. And as much as our God would love to be the judge who just sits there and tells us the answer and we just do it. He knows that that's not how it works. He knows that as much as God can throw at us and give to us and persuade us, at the end of the day, we each make that choice. We decide, is the resurrection worth Laying down my life, being dead to sin, being buried with Christ, and being raised in a resurrection just like his. And all the evidence presented today, the question is still, when the gospel is presented to you, what will you do? Having heard that Jesus is Lord, Will you believe amongst all the evidence that Jesus is Lord? Repent of your sins and be cleansed in a way that only he can do. Be buried with him in baptism where you are united with Christ in his burial. Live for him waiting and remaining in that 
hope of resurrection and one day be resurrected just as he was to new life. If there's anybody who has not done that or is not faithful or anybody wants to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.